Good morning. My name is Madeline, and I'm going to be your facilitator and moderator for today for our Herbs for Stress and Resilience class. I want to welcome all of you. Thank you for coming. Today, we're broadcasting from Chechenya Oholoni and uh, unceded Southern Pomo territory. We're honored to be here. And we are all a part of the Bay Area Herbal Response Team, or Bayheart. And Bayheart came together because of the pandemic, and it really seeks to mend uh, social inequalities, marrying herbal medicine and social justice uh, to support people who otherwise wouldn't have access to healing and medicine. Right now, we're in the middle of our Firesider fundraiser. Our Firesider fundraiser is an awesome way to support our work. We are uh, selling Firesider for $10 a bottle. Every bottle of Firesider sold supports us in being able to distribute two bottles of Firesider. And right now, those are mostly going to unhoused Bay Area residents. We feel like this is a really important way to show up for community during COVID because Firesider is such a good way as we're slipping into fall to build immunity and to support our, support our systems as they're being asked to do a lot through fire season, through pandemic times, and just through the transition to winter. I'm so excited for this class Kara and Emiliano are really profound teachers with a lot of experience. They work together as herbalists and collaborators. They're friends. Um, they particularly do a lot of work around uh, trans issues and herbalism. And both of them have the unique ability of having a foot both in the medical field and in the herbal field. So. Kara is a nurse practitioner, Emiliano is a fourth year med student, and they're offering a, a, a kind of special class for us today. Kara has been in practice for 15 years. They have deep knowledge and teach at both Ancestral Apothecary and the California School of Herbal Studies, as well as teaching other places around the Bay Area. They are of Anglo and Ashkenazi descent. They're genderqueer. And they, as a nurse practitioner, have so much to share in addition to their herbal background, but really have a, a depth of experience working with herbs. And Emiliano, for, on, for their own right, are a clinical energetic herbalist. They were trained with Karen Sanders and Sarah Holmes at the Blue Otter School. And they continue to work with Karen and Sarah through the, uh, the Herbal Highway. They're one of the hosts of the Herbal Highway, which you can find through KPFA. They're also a fourth generation healer and plant meddler uh, of Mestizo Chicano heritage. And you can find Emiliano at Instagram, uh, their handle is trans.herbalist, or you can find them at emilianolemes.com. And like I said, that Kara and Emiliano, they're frequently working together. They even have a book in the works. That's really exciting. Our, um, our model as Bayheart in offering these classes is that we offer them on a pay what you can basis. And that means that anyone can take this class. And if you're seeing this class online, if you have the capacity to give us a donation, we would really appreciate it. It supports us in the sustainability of our work. And we just don't want there to be any barriers to this kind of information. And so that is how we're working. And we're also working in a one-for-one -one fundraiser model. So 50% of all of the fees for all of the, for this class, for the live version of the class, go to the St. James Infirmary. And Kara's about to tell us about St. James.
Communities Infirmary, which is a collective in San Francisco um, that supports um, sex workers and trans folks, both physically and mental health um, medicine. And they've been around a really long time and they're struggling like everyone else during this time. So we're really excited to partner with them and support them in doing the work that they're doing um, while we're able to also spread our medicine in the community. And their work is so multifocal and awesome. So we encourage you to give dollars directly to them um, and or, you know, if you gave money to this class, thank you so much because we're gonna pass a good chunk of that along. And, and one more housekeeping note is that I am going to be typing plant names into the chat for you. So if you don't catch something, I'm gonna put it in the chat. If you have any questions, uh, Feel free to hold questions till the end. However, if you have a clarifying question, I'll be able to answer it um, in the chat for you. So clarifying questions can go into the chat. Any other questions we'll hold to the end. If you can um, share your video, we would love to see your faces. And that's it, thank you. Thanks, Madeline. Um, all right. So I would love to, go ahead. Can I say before we start also, yeah. just if, if folks would be down to type in their names and where they're located right now, I'd love to hear where folks are coming from. And it's so nice to see so many of your faces. So thanks for joining us. But then I'll let, I'll let Kara still get us started. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I thought it would be nice to just start with some a little bit of movement to kind of get this grounded and help de-stress our crazy lives and kind of be present a little bit more. Um, so if you are able to stand up, go ahead and do that. Um, and otherwise stay seated and comfortable. Um, and the first thing that I would like us to do is just to kind of spin and twist your arms and kind of let your arms very, your hands very gently strike against your kidneys, against your back, and just allow your spine to twist a little bit, allow your gaze to swing around the room with your head. And just gently bring your body to center. And then go ahead and reach up. And then if you wanna reach down and touch the earth or the floor. And roll up really slowly, head last. And then we're gonna do um, a really amazing, very, very brief exercise that you can do anywhere at any time that will help you literally drop out of your stress fight or flight response and back into your body. Um, so that is unfocused gaze. So I would like you to put your hands behind your back at your sides, just out of eyesight. You can do this standing or sitting. And then you're gonna slowly kind of raise them forward until you can see them out of your peripheral vision. So you're unfocusing your gaze into the whole circle of your peripheral vision. And you might feel your shoulders drop. You might just notice that just this simple act of unfocusing your gaze helps you drop out of your head and above your head back into your core, into your body, maybe all the way down to your feet. Maybe taking a breath into your feet, feeling the earth or onto your sit bones if you're sitting in a chair or on the ground. And then, I would love for you to notice the furthest point that you can see, maybe out a window, at something distant, and then kind of refocus the computer, and then focus something really far and distant. And this act of changing our focus can also help us ground back into our bodies and relax our nervous system. So I invite you, as we're sitting on a computer for another couple of hours tonight, potentially, if you already been on computers today to remember to gaze far away and not just at the computer. Um, and then our last thing I'll have everybody just start shake it out. Just shake it out, make some noise. You're all on mute. So I'm the only one who's making a fool of myself. <laughs> Stick your tongue out, shake it out. Have you ever noticed animals, right, when they get stressed, when they have a trauma, they shake it off of their body. They physically release that fire. Just get it out, get it out, get it out. Oh, ah. Ah. All right, thank you.
I'll invite you to come back and sit down or make yourself comfy however you need to be present. Thanks, Kara. That was helpful for me too. I don't know. I'm sure many of y'all are coming off of a long day, as many of us are in this time and a lot of screen time and all that. Um, so we are certainly going to dive into talking about a bunch of plants that are accessible, amazing medicines for both stress and resilience. But before we go there, we just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, what creates stress in our lives and also where resilience comes from in our lives. And one of the first things that I want to name is that there are many factors outside of our control that cause us stress and create trauma. And, you know, we're, we're little individuals who are able to control our corner of the universe and not everything. Um, and also that systemic oppression and you know racism sexism poverty um many many other isms that we can name right now disproportionately affect some people compared to others while they affect all of us right um and i so i think it's important to name that some of our spirits and some of our bodies accumulate more of the difficulties than other people's spirits and bodies do because of the way the world is set up the structures in our world and in our lives that being said, you know, we never want to blame somebody for like the stress and the trauma that they are accumulating. And also, it's helpful to focus on and learn about what actually is in our corner of the universe that we can affect and modify. Um, so we may not be able to, to shift what is actually landing on us from the outside world, but we can shift our responses to stress, to how we let them in, maybe don't let them in quite as much, how we respond, how we tend to our bodies, and that all of these are practices of resilience in the face of a violent world. Uh, one other piece that I like to frame in here that I think a lot of us have thought about is that, you know, a lot of us, all of us grew up in a traumatic world. Again, some with more, you know, trauma and stress than others. Um, and we all learned ways to cope with that. And we all learned successful adaptations to cope with that, right? Like we all gained skills to help us keep our hearts and our spirits intact or keep our bodies intact, right? Kind of whatever was most important for our survival, we learned those skills. Um, and those were supportive responses at some point in our lives. And not all of those responses that we learned may be equally supportive at this point in our lives. So a lot of what plant medicine can help us do is tease apart those you know, responses that we learned that continue to support us as full beings in this time, and what responses don't optimally support us anymore, and that we're, you know, ready to release. Um, to explore these concepts a little bit, I want to guide us in an activity together. Um, so who here is stressed? Can I like see some hands? So everybody, <laughs> because hello, 2020, like the world is on fire, election. Okay, anyways, I'm not even gonna go down that path, sorry. Um, but yes, we're stressed. What I want us to identify is how the stress is manifesting internally in us so that we have more information to receive teachings from this class that will optimally support us in shifting towards a more balanced state despite the stress we're experiencing. So um, I want you to go ahead and find your seat a little bit. Um, drop into where you are. If standing is better for you, if lying down is better for you, all of those are totally fine. But just, you know, find yourself where you are in your body, in the world, in this moment. And then I want you to bring up in your, in your thought some of the stressors that are impacting you in this time. And I'd like you to do that at like a 30% volume, not at a 100% volume, okay? Or a volume otherwise that is like skillful for you in this moment to be engaging. So I want you to go ahead and do that while also dropping into your body. And then just start noticing. Notice what parts of your body are calling to you. 
notice if there are feelings you're holding and where you're holding them. These might be physical sensations. They might be emotional sensations. There's absolutely no right or wrong answers here. But I just want to invite us to take about a minute here and, and do that noticing. Are these older patterns for you maybe? Are there new things coming up in this time? What speaks to you when you listen? I'm going to invite us to take a few deep breaths. Potentially give some love to areas that you think need some love. See if the breath can lend some expansiveness or some smoothness, some release. You know, whatever it is that might be called for by what you noticed. You can give yourself a little thank you for showing up and paying attention to your body for this short time together. And we'll come on back together. I'm wondering if a couple of brave folks, knowing, knowing that this is being recorded, if, if any brave folks might be interested in sharing a piece of what they experienced when listening to themselves in that way. I, I wouldn't necessarily either, given that it's being recorded. So it's not a pressure, but just an invitation forward. Or maybe we can pause the recording for a second. Madeline, would you be down to do that? I'd be happy to. Hang on one moment. Oh, thanks, Madeline. Um, so we call this next piece, What Would Your Ancestors Do? Um, because for several reasons, right? We carry our ancestors' traumas and their resiliency. We carry um, the ways that our ancestors protected themselves in our cellular memory. Um, and Western medicine is just catching up with the study of epigenetics, which most traditions have known forever is ancestral wisdom and ancestral memory, um, that you literally physically get your cells and your genes turned on or off based on your ancestors' experience. And the amazing thing about that is that if genes that are unhelpful and unhealthy for us get turned on, we have the capacity in this lifetime to turn them off or to mitigate them or to offer them healing and support um, and to change it for the next generation or for changing our ancestors' trauma and healing in our own lifetime, which is pretty profound. Um, sorry, I'm going to turn on a light because I'm feeling... Like it's really dark in here. I hope that doesn't blind anybody. <laughs> um, the other piece of learning your ancestors is to follow your own lineage of healing, which I think as a white person is really important to acknowledge because so many folks, especially in this country, have kind of started to hungry ghost other traditions, right? They will like cling on to a tradition of healing that seems really cool and wonderful and probably is, but by taking it for yourself, and especially if you're making money off of it, then 
there's a way of appropriation that is really inappropriate and doesn't lend itself to healing of the tradition that it's coming from. So learning your ancestors is profound medicine for you and your, for your community. Um, and every culture in the world has used herbs and flowers and water as healing, right? In their, in their physical body, in their emotional body, in their spiritual body. Um, and I think it's only modern Western medicine that's ever thought to dissociate the three of those, the physical, emotional, and spiritual bodies. Um, when we put them back together, we realize that they're, we are all connected. They are separate pieces of one whole. Um, and we have only named them separately because it helps us to classify things as humans in that way, but not because they're actually separate. Um, can I be a butt and say also, like, I think, like, that's also a really Western idea, right? That, like, mind, body, and spirit are separate entities, and that's a really colonial idea. And that I think, like, decolonizing ourselves and um, our lives, our experiences, our emotions, like, really means undoing that notion that, like, somehow, like, there's a mind and a body, and there's one that has control over the other, and it's a bad paradigm. It's a bad Western paradigm. <laughs> Um, I'll tell a very quick story. My, um, I worked at a farmer's market selling my herbs and the woman next to me had a booth where she sold rocks and crystals and she had these heart-shaped rose quartz that she sold and this woman came up to her and said, I need something for my heart. And she offered her this rose quartz heart rock and the woman said, so is this for my physical body or for my emotional body? And the woman that I worked with, Maria, she said, Yes. And then the, the, the woman looking for the heart medicine said, no, no, no. Is it for my physical body or my emotional body? And Maria is like, I don't understand the question. And there, and I, 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 I was, I kind of like stepped in and I was like, I think that you are saying the same things and really that they are one and the same. And that when you heal your emotional body, you heal your physical body and vice versa. Um, that working on both will be powerful medicine for the other. Um, I, I really believe that. I have, I have witnessed people who had a broken heart and literally they died of their heart failing. Um, or I've seen people who, um, you know, took some spirit medicine for their heart and all of a sudden had less palpitations. So there, there, isn't, um, there isn't a disconnect except in our minds. Um, do we want to, um, I would offer that if anybody has, um, a story of their ancestors resilience and the practice that they use in that resilience, um, or, or ritual, if anybody has something that they wanted to share. And if you'd like to share and you just want me to uh, pause the recording, just you can message me in the chat and I can do that too. I'm happy to share. Um, I'm Daniela, she, her. Um, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Will you stand a little closer to your mic? Sorry, yeah, we are using a thing. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Cool. Um, Let's see, the first one that came to me is that no one in my mother's family has ever gotten their tonsils removed because I'm really lucky to have come from a lineage in Mexico where um, a lot of ancestral medicine was still passed down. And that's one thing I feel really proud of and happy about like Mexican culture absolutely has its issues and has its own levels of racism um, and classism but there's also the flip side of that is like this really beautiful culmination of cultures coming together and like medicinal practices uh, unite all of these 
Western indigenous uh, African diaspora. And um, my great grandmother, grandmother, and reluctantly on me, my mother have been using banana leaf, uh, banana, bananas to cure tonsillitis. tonsillitis. Um, and it's really gross and uncomfortable, <laughs> but it works. <laughs> I hated it as a kid, but um, you like grill bananas, like the peel of a banana, and you put it on your throat, and um, then you eat the like the hot mash with cinnamon, canela, and um, it really, really works. Uh, it, it, it reduces inflammation and soothes everything from the inside out. So like if you're, if you're around all these horrible fires, it can really help with um, soothing that as well. That's a little <laughs> sticky <laughs> anecdote. <laughs> I love that. And also because I, whatever, like we all have different opinions about like Western medicine. I'm totally becoming a doctor, but I have so many critiques of Western medicine, but I think we're too quick to take out kind of important organs and the tonsils are important immune organs. And so being able to approach them naturally and maintain them in our bodies to help our nervous, i sorry, our immune system, that, that is, that's a, um, that's a form of resilience. Absolutely. I really appreciate you sharing that, Daniela. And then a oh, sad note is it's not working as well anymore because our bananas are monocultured and no longer indigenous diverse bananas. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> In order for us to be resilient as a people, we need to be uh, stewards of seeds and indigenous plant diversity. That's such an important lesson. Thank you. Yeah, and it's very, very true. And any other story of resilience? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Kara. I was gonna say the same thing. Yeah, any other story of resilience that folks wanna share this? It could be plant, it could be ritual, it could be many things. I'll jump in, I'm Sid. Um, hi. So <clears throat> the thing that I've, it's been coming up and I've been thinking about this a lot. So my family's from Taiwan and um, been thinking a lot about death and dying and rituals around that. Um, and I had an orchid plant recently die. Um, and it's, it's gotten me thinking about how in my family, when there's, um, when family members have passed away and we've gone through ceremony of, um, like saying goodbye and doing a funeral or whatever it's called, is there's this ritual that our family does is placing um, fresh orchid flowers all over the body before they close the casket and like literally just covering the whole body in a blanket. And I've been thinking about that, how this, you take this really uh, tender and fragile and intricate flower and that becomes what we coat our um, loved ones in as we send them off um, as they become ancestors in this way of um, how something so simple can be so powerful um, and so seeing like as I was sitting with my my orchid plant that did not make it um, and just honoring how life and death and how um, I can be holding that and yet there's um, yeah like both my grandparents as I'm sitting with that, like are covered, right? Of the, um, as their bodies decompose, the orchids decompose with them. And there's something just really, I don't have more to say. It's just, that's what I've been thinking about a lot around life and death and the ways we get held. Thank you so much, Sid. And yeah, when Karen and I, Kara and I were talking about, um, you know, if there was a ritual that, you know, we'd share a resilience practice that we'd share that comes from our ancestry. Um, we both also thought of like grief and death related rituals. Um, and that there, you know, I think that the transition out of this life of a loved one is a moment of acute stress when um, resilience practices are deeply, deeply needed. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons why so much death ritual is really deeply encoded across many cultures. 
was that, you know, we're humans are made to be in social connection with other beings and in loving connection with other beings, human beings and other living beings and non-living beings and all kinds of things. But, um, you know, those, those relationships, yeah, I, I really, I really appreciate also, um, how, how, how plants and how native plants are a piece of that helping folks transition in a good way out of this life. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, and I, I had thought of um, ofrendas for Dia de los Muertos, um, and and Kara had thought about, uh, do you want to share briefly? Um, I remember thinking, um, my mom grew up Jewish, and I grew up in a very small town, pretty far from a synagogue, and so we we had some, we, we celebrated everything, right? We celebrated Passover and Hanukkah, but Easter and Christmas and, you know, pretty much everything except the high holy days, which are happening right now. <laughs> um, but I remember thinking the moment when my grandfather died and I'm gonna tell a story about my mom and she's sitting right here with me. Um, I remember when my grandfather died and our whole family came together to sit Shiva, which is a practice of just being with your family, just sitting and only telling stories about the person who had passed. And all of your extended family and friends bring you food so you don't have to cook or do anything. You just sit together and you talk about the person who passed. And I remember thinking that, oh, this is why we have rituals, is for this moment where we have nothing else and we cannot function and there's a process that we follow because there's nothing else you can do right now. You have to just be present with your family and with your loved ones and eat food that other people made for you and cry into the food and tell stories. And I think even though it's a very simple ritual, if we didn't have that set in stone of how you sit in Shiva for the certain number of days and with the certain foods and the certain people present, we would, we would be much more lost. We wouldn't feel this ability to let go of that person in such a profound way. Um, and I remember really thinking, oh, maybe I should learn a little bit about Judaism <laughs> because of that. <laughs> yeah, and I can guarantee that every single one of our lineages, every single one of our ancestries has its rituals. Like no indigenous people to any place didn't have its rituals. So anyways, this is, we kind of took a deep dive into like really encouraging each other and ourselves um, to do the work of finding what's in our ancestry. And I can guarantee your ancestors are going to feel really pumped about you doing that work. <laughs> As, as much as our ancestors can be pumped, I think they can be. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you feel ready to move into herbs, Kara? I'm ready. Are you ready? Yeah. Do you want to take it? Take the starting parts. Or do you want me to? Are you talking to me? Yeah. Uh, go ahead. So just just a couple of notes before we dive into herbs. One is that. Any, you know, shorter class on herbs like this one is just a beginning, you know. So we're going to share some of our favorite herbs for some of the things we'll be discussing, like nervous system nourishment and stress and anxiety and depression and other protection. Um, but we're not covering every herb that could be helpful for each of these conditions because there's so much plant medicine out there. You know, again, each of our lineages has the plant medicine for all of these things. Um, and also each herb that we do discuss has many other uses too. <laughs> so we're focusing on its uses for stress and resilience. Um, and it may be that, you know, certain herbs are a better match for you because they also align with other physical or energetic um, things going on in your life. Yeah. Um, what else? Um, we'll also discuss some of the precautions um, with some of these herbs. Most of them are quite safe for almost everybody, but there's some that it's good to have a couple of things in mind about. And I think that's all the kind of heads up, you know, once again, just that there's no such thing as a mind body spirit split. Um, so Kara, go ahead. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about actions of herbs as we go through these lists of some of our favorite herbs. Um, and I think of actions of herbs as like the class of herbs that, um, that gives you, um, like, an idea if you don't have that one herb, you might have another herb in this class of herbs or this category. So that 
Um, you can also like go to your spice rack and say, what do I have on my spice rack that can be helpful when I need it, right? Um, so nervous system nourishment, how do we heal and nourish our entire nervous system? Um, and a lot of the herbs that do that, that physically heal either the myelin sheath that coats the nerves or that helps the nerves grow connections, and grow new patterns in our brain, those move really slowly. So a lot of these herbs are not, they're not gonna like make you feel great right now. They're going to, if you take them every day for months, you're gonna notice that you have less reactivity and more resiliency in the face of stressors, in the face of your triggers coming up, right? Um, some of my favorite, favorite herbs for this are, one is milky oats. And this is the same plant as oatmeal that has been, oatmeal has been cultivated to be a food, but there's a wild version that is, I believe, native to Europe that is now naturalized all over our hillsides in California. It's super abundant. There's no problem with harvesting mass amounts of it anytime you want because it is so invasive and so abundant. It is growing where it's needed. Um, and a lot of people in the, in the springtime is when you harvest the oats themselves, when they, they literally will like kind of pop like a pimple and there's like a white goo that comes out of them. And we call that the milk stage of the oat, um, just for a nice visual. So you know exactly when to harvest the oats. Um, and oat it's doesn't sweet though. It's not creepy. <laughs> <laughs> like truly it's a sweet liquid. <laughs> yeah. And when I harvest milky oat tops, the little seed head, I will tincture them either in apple cider vinegar or in alcohol or something that will preserve it. Um, and then I will sometimes cut the green stalks and make dry them to make tea out of. Um, and this is a very, very water soluble plant. So you need a very low percentage of alcohol um, to preserve it and just drinking lots and lots of milky oat tea. And it doesn't, it has a, a mild sweet flavor, but not a ton of flavor. So you can add it to every single tea you're making and it will get to your nervous system and it won't overpower any of the flavors. Um, another of my favorite nurse, nervous system nourishing herbs is St. John's wort. Um, and this is the traditional use of St. John's is to heal nerves that are damaged. So that can be physical nerve that's been cut or harmed, or you know, if you've had COVID and lost your sense of smell, this would be a great herb to you know put in a little oil and then snort up your nose, or just drink the tea or take the tincture, and get it you know directly onto that nerve that's damaged by the virus. Um, but St. John's Wort is um, it's called St. John's because it blooms on the summer solstice, St. John's Day. Um, some people will call it St. Jones wort. I'm sure it has other names, um, but it's a sunshine plant. And I also think of it for the deep winter when you feel that sad, that seasonal affective depression, that, that grief when you don't get enough vitamin D from the sunshine, then St. Jones wort is a lovely herb for just holding your spirit and your emotions when it feels overwhelming in the world. So we probably could all use a little bit right now as the sun is being blocked by the smoke and we're all in the depths of all of the craziness that's happening this year. Um, the, the caveat with St. John's wort is that it can make you photosensitive. So if you're taking a lot of it or putting it on your skin and then going in the sun, you could get a mild sunburn. There's that. Um, the other caveat, which is a very theoretical, it hasn't actually been studied as far as I know, but you will find it in every medical text there is that St. John's will amplify the way that your liver breaks down or doesn't break down medications. And so if your liver is breaking down your medication too fast, that medication will be less effective. And if it breaks it down too slow, it could become toxic. So, you know, if you're taking medications, check to see if it interacts. You know, you can ask an herbalist, you can look on a medical app of the check on drug herb interactions. St. John's is the only herb as far as I can tell in those med, med interaction um, apps. 
Um, so if you have depression and you're taking an SSRI, you don't need St. John's wort, but you could take St. John's wort instead of an SSRI. Does that make sense? Um, or you could lower your SSRI as you're raising your St. John's wort. Um, it's really a profound antidepressant. Um, and I think it's because it reheals nerves and it helps them make new tendril connections of all the dendrites and axons and all the ways, right? Because our, our brain creates grooves in it when we do patterns over and over again. It, starts to make the same so that it's easiest for us to just do that thing we do in our stress response. And St. John's work can start to shift those negative patterns that don't serve us. The other action of nourishing the nervous system that I'll name right now are um, adaptogens. And these are things that help our body adapt to stress by working on the adrenals. And the adrenal glands are these little pyramids that sit on top of the kidneys and they are in charge of, they're like the interconnection of your nervous system and your endocrine system, right? So when your nervous system goes haywire and sounds the alarm bells, your adrenal glands respond and they throw a tantrum. And when the baby throws a tantrum, they get anything they want to quiet the baby, right? Your adrenals are like a two-year-old going, give me hormones because I'm going to throw a tantrum. So you're like, great, take my sex hormone, take my metabolism hormone, take whatever you need because we got to calm the baby, right? And so herbs that are adaptogens calm the adrenal stress response, that cortisol, that adrenaline output that the adrenals are so known for. Um, and I'm going to pass this back. No, you want me to just finish that piece? Why don't you speak to some adaptogens right now? So this is, it is a little bit, it overlaps with nervous system nourishment, but it's also this distinct thing as Kara's talking about. So yeah, I say finish it off. Yeah. Um, and I think that the, again, with adaptogens, like Nervine nourishers are that they work better over time. You might feel a little reaction immediately and uplift and support, um, and you might not. And you will notice more, less reactivity over time to your nervous system responding to stressors. Um, I'm sure you all have a couple of adaptogens that are your favorites. Anybody have an adaptogen that you love? We've got some herbalists on here. It's a weird action herb you might. I love Eleuthero. Eleuthero, yeah. Which was known as Siberian ginseng before they were like, this is not a ginseng, you cannot call it that. Um, yeah. The, a lot of um, Eastern and uh, Eastern um, Asian countries and also Eastern US cultures have um, practices with different ginsengs. And ginseng when they're older are adaptogens and when the roots are younger, they act more as stimulants. Um, so just being conscious and careful of the, if you, if you use ginseng as an adaptogen, um, Eleuthero, I find, is an amazing, it's a Siberian plant, so it's grown in Canada and in um, Siberia and Mongolia, um, up in Russia, and it's, it's, it's the root, right? And it's a surviving plant. It's a plant that's dug its roots into the ground and is going to survive no matter what the temperature and the weather and the storms and the snow and the ice do to it above. And I feel like that's what adaptogens do. They're like these deep roots that keep us rooted to the earth, that keep us nourished, even when we're like buffeted from all sides with these crazy storms. Um, another of my favorite Siberian high north adaptogens is rhodiola, a rose root. And it literally smells like roses. Um, and the inside of it, I actually got to process like 10 pounds of fresh rhodiola root one time. And there was like these layers, concentric layers of sweetness. And it, as it got closer to the middle, it got pinker and pinker and it smelled like roses the whole time. And in the very center were these little like pink gummy bears. 
and I might have eaten the inside out of every single one of them. Um, <laughs> it's really fun to get to process medicine. It, you get to take on a lot of the medicine just from having your hands on it, but you know, nibbling a piece here and there too. Um, another one that is um, from India, but also is very easy to grow here is Tulsi. Um, and Tulsi is a, it's a, a basil. So it has that warming, spicy, aromatic scent. Um, and it's so good for calming the nervous system and rebalancing the adrenal glands. Um, so if you like your kind of sweet, basil-y, minty spices, that's a lovely tea to have in the evening or in the morning to calm your nervous system as the day begins. Any other adaptogens on people's minds that they would love to talk about tonight? We got reishi mentioned in the chat. Reishi, which is a mushroom and a, and a woody, solid mushroom. And I always, whenever I think of mushrooms, I think of two of my teachers, um, Karen and Terry. And they used to be a couple. They're not anymore. But they're mushroom people. And you always know mushroom people because when they start talking about mushrooms, their eyes start to twinkle and they turn into kind of mushrooms and you just see like little funguses sprouting out of them. They're like so excited. And Terry is this very small woman who's very hyperactive and she's really excited and she talks like this. And she's like, and I love the maitake mushrooms and they're kind of frilly and they're kind of cute. And then Karen is this very big woman who's very solid, very scientific, knows her herbs and her medicine making. And she says, I love reishi mushroom. I love how solid it is. I love how grounded and connected to the trees it is. And I just, you can see these mushrooms in these humans, you know, they're just like beautiful mushroom people. Um, but re Rishi is, my experience is it's really good for coming into a meditative state. If you need to be focused and centered, it's a really lovely, tea it's very water soluble it's immune building properties so putting it into all your broths all your long cooked chais and teas it's bitter so it helps us digest our emotions um so rishi is a really lovely one and also it really supports the nervous system and um because this is so woody you really do need to boil it to get the the um, properties out of it so don't expect to like pour some water over it and then it becomes a tea. Yeah, yeah, it's a truly tough, truly tough mushroom. Yeah. I will pass it to you, Emiliana. Okay. Um, I totally wanted to say a couple of other things about adaptogens and because, okay, this is like blue water training, training with Karen Sanders and Sarah Holmes. A lot of what I learned is that there is a right moment for adaptogens and also adaptogens can really be overused. Um, and that the way that they're overused and is is in like not acknowledging our stress in a way where we're actually addressing the stress in our lives. Like it can be enabling of like allowing ourselves to continue being in stressful situations. So with with adaptogens, um, you know, there are absolutely times to use them. For many of us, this is a great time for adaptogens. <laughs> like literally this this time in the world and in life um, when like so many of us really need some extra support to get through our days. Um, and uh, also that we don't want our lives to turn into like, uh, you know, using adaptogens for every day forever. Um, yeah, and not because they'd harm you, but just because it doesn't um, support you in like moving through that into something else, if that makes sense. Um, and that's my perspective and that was what I was taught and other people teach different things about adaptogens. Um, the other thing that I'll mention is some of the plants that we talked about, like the ginsengs, um, it brings up a point for me that I think is really important about how we get our herbs. American ginseng, for example, is a beautiful, beautiful medicine that is incredibly overharvested in the wild. Um, and basically, nobody should ever buy or use wildcrafted American ginseng. And that's true for a lot of plants. Um, there's an organization called United Plant Savers that keeps a list of at-risk herbs that um, helps, and Melon just put that in the chat, um, that uh, really maintains this great list that helps us understand which herbs are being threatened because of overuse by herbalists in North America and overharvesting in the wild specifically. Um, many, many herbs can be grown, you know, cultivated by people with intention and are still beautiful, beautiful medicine when they're cultivated. So 
there's there's good reasons to be intentional about where we're getting our plant medicines from. Um, yeah. So um, I wanted to move into talking about nervous system stress. So we already talked about nervous system nourishment. And a number of the plants that work on nervous system stress, they might also be kind of in the same category of herbs we'll call nervines. But a lot of these may do that nourishment and at the same time act more acutely when we are experiencing stress right now and need some support in our stress. One of the plants that I love and use and give to clients and friends most often is skullcap, which is a cute and funny name. <laughs> Um, and I can't remember the story of why it's called Skullcap. I know I've learned it at some point. Do you know, Kara? I'm sure you know. I think it's just because of the way the flower looks. It has a little Skullcap like a monk or something. And I don't know. There's probably other stories. Yeah. But um, Skullcap is, it looks a lot like a mint. Some claim it in the mint family and others say it's not actually a mint. Um, but it has the, you know, the little, the little leaves on opposite sides. Um, and it grows very well in California, it grows very well in many places. Um, Skullcap is just wonderful. First, it is nourishing of the nervous system, like really nicely nourishing of the nervous system. It's also a nerve healer. Um, so for folks who are worried about taking St. John's wort because of some of the contraindications, like some of the ways it should not be matched with medicines, um, Skullcap can be a really good option for the nerve regenerating properties. Um, it's said that it, uh, it helps rebuild the myelin sheath. And um, not, so not just is it nerve healing, but really what I use it most for is that it helps relax nervous tension in the body. Um, so I'm gonna shout out to Willow, <laughs> uh, you know, as we were talking earlier, nervous tension. Um, and Skullcap is really especially good for stress that tends to turn into reactivity, right? So that's a keyword. Like when our when we take our stress and it like starts getting spiky and you know like yeah like sparking out of us and we start putting it onto other people and other things in this reactive way. That's one of the places skullcap really really shines, um, and that can also come up as irritability too. Um, it is really good if you're one of those kinds of people who is like, when you're stressed, you sit there and you are just like jiggling your foot, which like totally has been me in the past. <laughs> a little less these days, I think I've worked on it. Um, yeah, and uh, in addition to that, Skullcap is one of these herbs that's really good for helping overactive nervous systems come back down to a more normal level of nervous system function. Um, so, you know, jiggly foot people, um, those of us who's like our bodies and everything is just kind of really amped up and we're going too fast, too hard a lot of the time. And a lot of that is about kind of our nervous system response, if that makes sense. Um, and some people, because of that property where it helps bring us our energy back to kind of a, a regulated level, so many of us are so not used to that regulated level that we take skull cap and we think that skull cap makes us sleepy. Um, but most of the time I find that it's actually not actually sleeping making for people. It's just that people don't know what it feels like to be relaxed. And according to what my teachers tell me anyways, <laughs> the normal way for our nervous systems to be is relaxed. That elevated state should really be in response to, to acute stressors and shouldn't be our day to day. So skull cap, so beautiful. Um, in, in terms of that muscle tension, it is specifically also a muscular antispasmodic, meaning that it relaxes muscle tension in addition to kind of working on the nervous system aspects of the tension. So it's got the more strictly physical side and also the more nervous system based side. Um, what else do I wanna say about it? Um, it's good for shock. Like after, like I've given it to a lot of folks after like a car accident, for example, when they just feel really spun out and weird. It can help pull people back into their bodies. Um, and also for fear in general, um, just like taking the edge off of fear or like with jumpiness can help folks, um, again, calm the nervous system to not be as jumpy um, if, if somebody's nervous system is just too revved up. Um, because of kind of it, some of its more relaxing properties and because of the ways it works with fear, it can be helpful for nightmares. 
um, and for um, sleep when there's kind of some of these like over nervous system overactivity components to not sleeping very well. Um, I also often give it to folks when they've just had too much coffee, you know, and they're like, coffee, <laughs> like that kind of buzzy sparkiness. Um, and the best way to use it for that is just literally like a drop of skull cap or maybe three drops that works on the energetic level to help just like bring all that back in and down, like stop sparking out of your head and, you know, come back into the body. Yeah. Um, the good things to know about skull cap um, is that it is not good. It's, it doesn't always work for people with low blood pressure. Sometimes it can lower the blood pressure a little bit. So if you have low blood pressure, start with smaller doses and see how it works before you use larger doses. And um, also it can exacerbate like the pounding stage of a migraine. Um, so be a little cautious in using it around migraines. Yeah. And I see Daniela saying, I've used skull cap and valerian acutely with spasmodic asthma and bronchitis attacks that lasted hours and the two together would relieve the fear and the coughs. Absolutely. This next plan I'm going to talk about is actually really helpful for that kind of asthma also, which is passion flower. Um, you all know passion flower? I'm like, this, this is how I'll show passion flowers my tattoo. <laughs> um, passion flower also grows all over the Bay Area and many places. You wanted to show us your muscles. I just wanted to show my, no, I wanted to show my tattoo because I think my tattoo is pretty. <laughs> Regina Lare did this for me. Good artist. Um, and uh, passion flower is personally probably the herb I use most. Um, it's just got a really nice cooling, smoothing, soothing energy to it. Um, and also works on releasing and adjusting some deeper stuff. Um, so some of the things here is that passion flower specifically is, is for muscle tension, even more so than skull cap. Um, and muscle tension with an emotional component. So when it makes us aware of how the emotional is held in the physical, essentially how our feelings are held in our bodies. Um, and yeah, so again, that, that muscle tension with the emotional component because it makes us aware um, of, of the connection. Um, it is also good for mind chatter. Um, not exactly, like some people will use it for more like cyclical thinking, right? Which can happen a lot when folks are stressed. Um, but uh, kind of just that like ongoing kind of like background, like self-criticism or voice or other voices in the head, passion flower can be helpful for all of that. A herb I'd suggest that is even more helpful for like the circular thinking is vervain. And that again would be like in spirit doses, like one to three drops or passion flower and vervain mixed can be really helpful. Um, Passion flower can be really good for preventing and treating headaches, including migraines, um, when there's any tension or stress component. Um, and uh, at times it can also just be helpful, like even if there isn't that stress component it can still be helpful for um, headaches uh, because there's a mechanism in the body where like headaches often have something to do with like the veins in er, the veins, the arteries in the brain and blood pressure and passion flower can help lower blood pressure. So it can help with headaches in general. Yeah. Um, actually, both skullcap and passion flower can be helpful when stress is getting in the way of allowing us to feel sexy. Um, so if you're one of those people who like, if, you know, it's not that like you don't have a libido, it's not that like you wouldn't want to like be sexy with yourself or somebody else. It's just like, there's too much going on and like you can't let go. Skullcap and passion flower can be, both be really helpful for that. Um, passion flower a little bit more when it's the nervous tension skull cap, um, yeah, a little bit more with kind of like the like frazzled energy. Yeah. Um, what else do I want to say about it? Also helpful for insomnia when there's like a nervous body component, nervous tension body component. Um, with skull cap, you want to be again, a little bit help, uh, careful of um, taking higher doses if you have a uh, low blood pressure because it can lower blood pressure. And also you don't want to take very high doses if you have uh, sleep apnea, because it can kind of help you sleep a little too deeply while you're relaxing those muscles. Um, I haven't actually heard of that being a problem with anybody, but there's, those are you know, just precautions. Um, the one other thing before I pass it over to um, Kara again, or am I passing it over to Karen again right now? Yeah, maybe. I don't know, we'll decide in a sec. In terms of the, <laughs> in terms of the like herbs for stress is, 
other things matter too in our lives, of course, right? These are herbs that help us bring down our stress levels in acute situations and also over the longer term. But there's also factors in our lives that can add to, like go the opposite way, right? Herbs are helping us like calm down our nervous system. Other factors can amp up our nervous system, including things we eat and drink like sugar, coffee, um, chocolate even, uh, caffeine in general, alcohol. All of those things can activate our nervous systems. Um, so in times of increased stress, I, I know a lot of us want to kind of like go back to the earthly pleasures um, or the corporeal pleasures, including a lot of these, you know, sugary substances and other things. Um, and sometimes there's times when we like really need to support ourselves by not going down that path and giving ourselves other, other worldly pleasures instead. So pay attention to how those things affect your body. Yeah. Um, in terms of dosing for passion flower and, um, and skull cap, the way that I would do it is for tincture, it would be like one to three drops of a tincture. If it is, um, more of an emotional or more of an energetic, um, thing that I'm trying to shift. And if it's more physical, then I would do probably in the range of 10 to 15 drops, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Hey, so Kara, do you want to talk about anxiety and agitation next? Or do you want to talk about depression next? We were kind of alternating, but we got out of the alternating. Um, sure. Yeah, let's do that. That makes sense. Which one? I'll, I'll start with agitation. And oh, I, I want to talk about agitation. Next. Oh, sorry. Okay, got it. <laughs> I see what you're asking me. Um, go ahead. Keep going. Okay, I'm going to keep talking. I'm a talker. Sorry, y'all. Not sorry, not sorry. I guess that's what we're here for. Um, <laughs> so anxiety and agitation. Skullcap and passion flower can both be very helpful for anxiety and agitation. And there's other herbs that are even more specifically helpful for anxiety, particularly, I think. But every herb, you know, because we each of our anxiety or each of our agitation comes from a different place within us. And, you know, that takes cultivating the awareness that we were talking about to sort out what the root is. Um, different herbs are going to be differently helpful for different people. So one of the herbs I recommend most for anxiety is chamomile, which is, yeah, chamomile, it's like, it's one of those plants that like, you know, is so readily accessible. You don't want like crap chamomile, like from, you know, like a brand that's been sitting for two years at the grocery store. That, that's not going to be as good for medicine. Um, but like fresher tea bags, absolutely. Um, chamomile from your backyard, chamomile tincture. Um, you just want to make sure that like, it's like you want to, when, whenever you're using a tea, you want to make sure you can actually smell the plant. You know what I mean? Like that it's there, that it still has like ener energy in it. Um, and chamomile often I think can be left kind of too long and then, and then we don't perceive it as real medicine because it's kind of lost its spark. Um, but yeah, I think that it's really underrated, chamomile. It's another one of those plants that's really smoothing, but as compared to some of the other plants we've talked about, it's very warming um, and it's grounding. It's not hot, just warming. Um, and it's a really nice grounding medicine. Um, it's especially good for the kind of anxiety that just like gnaws away at people in a persistent way. I know I quote Karen and Sarah a lot, but I've spent a lot of time learning about herbs from them. But uh, Karen Sanders describes this as rabbity anxiety, like nye, 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 nye. it's just like gnawing away at you. Um, and it's also really helpful when fear spills over into anxiety or anger even too. Um, chamomile can be really helpful in preventing anxiety attacks if it's used regularly. And a, a regular medicinal use of an herb might be um, like a half a cup of tea several times a day or um, potentially, depending on whether you're going for the energetic dose or the physical dose, it could be Again, one to three drops or 10 to 15 drops three times a day, but kind of continuing to keep it in your system and work with it. Um, they're all, it's also really good for anxiety attacks when they're happening. And for that, I'd try like a good, a good drop of bowl of chamomile. Well, again, it can go either way here. You could do a drop, that might be the most helpful for you. You could do 15 drops, that might be, it might be the most helpful for you. Kara might suggest 30 drops, but I tend to go lower. <laughs> um, Chamomile is also really excellent. It's one of the herbs that's really excellent for folks who hold anxiety or emotions or stress, any of it, in their bellies. Um, so it's, 
it's like really good if your digestion runs on the cooler side because it's a warming plant. Um, it's also a bitter, so it's good for indigestion, it's good for gas, it's good for lack of digestive fire. Um, it's kind of companion plant that it does the belly work. Kara's gonna talk about more in a minute, but it's, it's a cooling herb. If you feel like your belly kind of runs too hot, that's lemon balm. So we'll talk more about lemon balm shortly. Um, because it kind of warms up digestion, one um, contraindication here, one precaution is that it's not always good for folks with GERD in, when you're using it in physical doses. So acid reflux or GERD go only with emotional doses um, or test it out before you do like a bigger physical dose because it can build up your acid in an unhelpful way. Um, and also it's good to take physical doses with food because it does um, release some, like it preps your belly for eating. And when you prep your belly for eating, it's good to put some food in with it. Um, and it's good for reducing tension in general, like uh, helpful for sleep when tension is what's preventing you from getting to sleep. Um, a second herb that I really love that's helpful for anxiety and agitation, also even for sleep, California poppy. Oh, I've got that one on my arm too, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> Um, this is like herbalist nerdy tattoo stuff. Um, the, the spirit medicine of California poppy that I specifically think of is, is for people who are stuck in their heads. Like you end here. You live in this part of your body and you don't get into this part of your body. So if that's part of what's happening with your stress profile is like really you're just like thinking, thinking, thinking all the time. You don't notice your body and you put your physical needs aside. Chamomile is really, really excellent for you. It gets you into your heart and into your body. Um, and yeah, of course it is important to be in our bodies. You know, Again, we are not beings uh, that have a mind-body split. We are whole beings and we need to be in our whole self. Um, it's also good for emotional pain that has become physical. So um, for all of that, we're using a spirit dose again. So one to three drops of a tincture, a sip of tea. It's great for anxiety from self-imposed pressures. Um, it's great when you're just twired, tired wired, like you've had a big day and you ate a lot of sugar and junk food and like you need to be able to like ramp down. It's good again, like kind of bringing the energy down and in. Um, I also think of this beautiful plant. Well, I think of it in several ways. One is that it feels like such a plant of place to me, right? It's a plant that grows on the West Coast. It's a plant that like has a very specific area that it calls home. It's a plant that calls us into our full physical homes. Um, it's also a plant that, like other poppies, um, like opium poppy, for example, um, like its cousin, which is, it's not opium poppy, obviously, but um, I think of it as like slowness medicine or kind of time magic medicine also, where it can help us, like when we're just moving too fast and we need to kind of be able to step back into present and into our bodies, it's good for helping with that kind of transition from fast time to kind of real time or plant time or slow time, depending on how you look at it. Um, a couple of other herbs that I'll name here. Lavender is so good for agitation. Um, lavender is again helpful for that kind of gravity anxiety. Um, it is also a nervine, so it strengthens the nervous system. It's good for when stress raises our blood pressure. Um, and mixed with motherwort is particularly good for that. Um, one warning with lavender, and also you don't have to use lavender as a, it's, um, it's really good as a tea for depression. We'll talk more about depression in a minute, but um, so I do encourage using it as a tea in that way. But for these other uses, you don't necessarily need to internalize lavender, like um, you know, for help with anxiety, for um, help even with hypertension, hanging out with living lavender, having like, a lavender scented sachet with you, um, whatever, and all ways of interacting with lavender. The, the scent is a lot of its medicine. Yeah. Um, one last one I'll say here is valerian. Um, and valerian was already mentioned. Uh, valerian is, it's um, best used when you use the root fresh. And that usually means that needs to be used as a tincture or another preserved extract. Um, if when it's when it's dried, it, it so fresh, it's warm and soothing. Dry, it's hot and stimulating, which is often not what we're looking for when we're trying to soothe our nervous systems, right? Um, valerian, for me, I think of 
for folks, again, whose nervous system, it's kind of like skull cap and like helping bring people's nervous systems down from an overactive level to a more normal level, except like skull caps kind of like, come on, like, let's come on back down here and skull caps, or sorry, and Solarian is like, you're going back down there now. <laughs> um, it's, it's heavier handed uh, and it's beautiful and it's right medicine for some of us sometimes. <laughs> Um, uh, I'll let's say see. that Go if ahead. you're sensitive to valerian, it'll knock you out. Yeah. And these plants that will help with major anxiety will also make you very sleepy. It might be a dose dependent thing or it might be your constitution. Um, and I have had the experience that dry valerian tea, although it smells like dirty socks, will is great sleepy time medicine for some folks. Yeah. You have to keep it in like three jars inside of another jar, inside of a bag, inside of another jar so that, you know, because it smells so good. So Sharon knows what valerian smells like when it's fresh or dry. Yeah. It is a particular. And the more dried it gets, the stinkier it gets, which yeah. sometimes makes it more potent medicine. Um, yeah. And I've, I've even had the experience with chamomile of, um, you know, I had a good friend who said, I've been doing so good. I'm drinking tea every single day, except that I get to work and then I fall asleep on my desk. And I was like, what are you drinking? And she's like, chamomile. And I was like, oh yeah, that makes me sleepy too. <laughs> yeah, totally. And valerian is kind of one of the heavier handed like sleep inducers also, as, as Kara was saying, for sure. So chamomile, definitely less strong at like knocking people out, making them sleepy than valerian. Valerian is one of the relatively, you know, one of the relatively strong herbs we have for inducing sleep. Um, and dry can be very, very effective for aiding sleep. Some people find that it makes, they can have a little valerian hangover that is stronger with the dry um, tea than with fresh preparations. Um, so, and that might mean like being a little groggy in the morning, things like that. Um, yeah, I really like fresh, fresh valerian. I really think its energy is like much smoother and just like much more kind of reinforcing of the nervous system. Um, oh, and as we mentioned before, also can be very helpful for panic attacks specifically. Yeah, so valerian is great there. Um, one out of maybe like a hundred people also responds to valerian in a contradictory way, like responds to valerian like cats respond to catnip and like it just like gets you like up and wild and, and um, I'm not sure, you know, exactly why that is the case for some folks as compared to others. It has to do with energy. I can't always call who is going to be that person and who isn't going to be that person, but it's worth trying at first uh, before kind of going deep with valerian. Um, and also valerian shouldn't be used in pregnancy, with breastfeeding, be careful with low blood pressure again, and with sleep apnea. And also if it's used long term, it can lead to depression. So if uh, you have a history of depression, be careful there. Okay, Kara, I'm gonna, speaking of depression. Um, I wanted to just say with depression and sometimes anxiety and depression can go hand in hand or look very similar to each other or folks can have both at the same time, which makes it feel more complicated of, are you trying to lower the anxiety or are you trying to boost someone's energy when they feel stuck and heavy and depressed? Um, and sometimes we can do both. Sometimes we have to be careful if someone tends to swing in both directions suddenly, we don't want to fling someone in the opposite direction. Um, so just keeping that in mind. Also just to name that depression is such a systemic symptom right now, and it's not a personal thing. And even though we are working on our, our own physiology and support of our own bodies, um, that, this is ambient right now, the anxiety and the depression, the systems that are holding those in place for humanity right now are really, really powerful and profound. So just to know that if you're experiencing these things, then they're, that's normal. And what we are trying to do is bring some lightness and joy and reminder that these plants are here to hold us, um, to bring the sunshine back in, to allow our hearts to be held in dark times and when things are overwhelming or scary or sad or um, full of moments that are that are difficult. Um, some herbs for depression and for the heart especially 
all things in the rose family, right? Because roses are both these delicate, beautiful, scented, aromatic, gorgeous, sexy flowers, and they have thorns. They are protected. They have open boundaries and protection. So holding your heart, nourishing your heart, keeping it held. Um, roses particularly, also apples are in the rose family. Um, plum blossoms, cherry blossoms, um, a lot of our, any kind of, a lot of our fruit vines like the blackberries and the raspberries and the thimbleberries. Um, the, the flowers of all of these plants are going to energetically have that heart nourishing protective protection, right? They've all got a little bit of spike to them. The hawthorn berry. And the hawthorn is one of the most well-researched herbs for the physical cardiovascular system, which we know is not separate from the emotional heart. So um, hawthorn is an amazing medicine for balancing the pressures in the heart, balancing the emotions of the heart, um, and when the heart feels heavy and stuck. Um, mimosa is, if you haven't seen this tree, looks like a pink puffball firework cotton candy um, toy. I mean, it's like kind of ridiculous. Also, it tastes so good. Yeah. <laughs> it literally is like with like pink frills. Like you just want to rub your face on them. Um, and the thing that I think of when I'm harvesting this plant is like when it's in its habitat, when it's growing on the tree, it blooms for days. And as soon as you cut the, plant, the flowers, if you don't like make them into medicine, they, they shrivel up and die immediately. They just turn brown and lose all of their vibrancy. So this plant is like, when you feel like you're shriveling up and losing your vibrant, juicy life force, it's like when you don't have those beautiful, like fireworks sparkles all around you, it should be glittery and joyful, right? Life is supposed to be that way. So this is like the gayest of gay plants. It's amazing. Um, lemon balm is another amazing plant. And, you know, at very low doses, lemon balm is an amazing antidepressant. It can really just, like, it's that lemony, minty, joyful, soul-holding, beautiful medicine. At sunshine. really high dose, no, go ahead. Sunshine. Sunshine. Sunshine in a, in a mint leaf. Um, really high doses, it's an antiviral. So there's a huge connection between your nervous system and your, and, and your immune system right? We know that. Um, so lemon balm, it's a tasty mint that you can easily put into any tea. You can take it as tincture too. Um, and we had on here um, a flower essence called Northern Lights. Um, that's an Alaskan essence. Um, and it's literally like capturing the heavens and bringing them into your body, right? Allowing your soul and mind to be expansive when things feel stuck and tight and small. Um, the other one that I'll put in here for depression and anxiety is a flower essence called um, single mother formula and it's for feeling guilty about doing too much and not enough all at the same time. This is for me like very profound medicine as I'm constantly feel like I'm, I have too much to do and I can't ever get it done and also like how could I ever take on so much for myself in the world? Um, so those are a couple of flower essence blends that are really powerful. Um, and all of these lovely medicines. Um, and Kara, who makes single mother formula? I think that it is um, the California Flower Essence Society. But I could be wrong. It's either them or the Alaskan Essences. Um, and if you don't know, an essence is literally the energetic vibration of the plant or the, the, the lights of the sky or um, this mo energetic moment. Um, and you can make your own flower essences. Um, and I'll tell a quick story. When my brother was having some really dark depression and he had gone to see a naturopath and she gave him 25 remedies to help him 
supplements of all sorts to kind of build his mood and make him okay. And he was so overwhelmed by the volume of things that she gave him that she, he couldn't do any of them. And shout out to Marco, who was with us on a hike and said, you should teach your brother how to make a flower essence. And we were hiking in the California hills and there were literally California poppies as far as you could see, just like blankets of gold on the hillsides. And we, I taught him how to make a California poppy flower essence that day. And he took it until it was gone. It was the only medicine that he took. And it was, he made it himself. He had full ownership and power and control and um, choice in taking that medicine and creating that joyful medicine for himself. And it really made a really profound difference. Um, I love that. And like his brother I have met once is like not the most like sensitive, uh, I mean, is a very, very kind person, but it's like also a bit of a dude, you know? Um, so it's, it's, that's a very tender image for me to hold on to. Not that he's not sensitive. That's not what I meant. <laughs> Maybe one of the most sensitive humans on the planet. Yeah. 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 Um, so in the interest of we are running out of time, um, I would like, um, should we do our mini ritual as a closing? Or is yeah. there anything else that you want to name before we, because it seems like we are at, we have less than five minutes. I know. I just want to say, boundaries and protection are also a big part of this and maybe we won't go into big depth into boundaries and protection but we could stay a little late after we kind of more formally close and some of the herbs we really recommend there are ocotillo, yarrow, rosemary, hawthorn again it's a really great protective herb which we discussed already so we can come back to those if folks want to come back but we want to also respect folks time so let's do this little closing and then we can keep going a little bit if folks wish or just take questions. Okay, so in closing together, I want to just invite you back into noticing yourself, find your seat, find your body, find yourself located in this time and in this place after listening and staring at a computer for a while, but talking about how to be in better connection with ourselves, with our bodies. And I'd like to invite folks to call forward a learned stress response that doesn't support you optimally anymore. You don't have to go too deep or too specific or too complicated. You know, might be coffee on when your day is too long. It might be being in your head rather than in your body when you get stressed out. It might be jiggling that foot Whatever, whatever it is for you. So I'll give folks a minute to lean into your body as you're doing this. Explore what's inside. And then I want to invite folks to thank that stress response for how it's served you and how it's held you, how it's helped you survive and protect yourself. And I want you to release it, to say, thank you. We've spent our time together. I don't need you in the same way I needed you and I'm going to let you go. And next, I want you to invite forward a supportive stress response that you want to grow to fill that space left behind by the stress response that doesn't fill you optimally anymore, support you optimally. When we move one thing out, it's important to move something else in. Otherwise, there's a tendency for something to hang on or something to move in that we don't want to move in. And this could be an intention of drinking a cup of chamomile tea in the evening or 
making sure you notice where the sunshine is outside or noticing the phases of the moon or turning off your screen at a certain time in the evening. Anything that supports you, what, what are you calling in as a, a fill-in for that empty space that you now have capacity for? And also if you think of something you learned tonight that can help support that practice you're growing even more, that's lovely. Tag that on too. Take a couple more breaths to solidify this. And also if you wish, thank your ancestors again, for the, all of the practices of resilience that they've passed along to you in your cells, in your body, and also through learned knowledge, through your family, through other learning that you've done. Thank your ancestors also for maintaining the plants that are here to support us as we also support them. And I'll call us all back together just to say thank you so much. I really appreciate that folks were participating tonight and you know, contributing as we went along and tried these different exercises. I'm really grateful for all of your presence and all of your knowledge and all that you all bring. And it's so nice to see a number of faces here that I know and a number that I haven't known before. So thank you. Um, and we are happy to honor your time and thank you so much for being here. And if you need to go, please do. Um, we will send out the recording to everybody. So if you want to review it or pass it on, feel free to do that. Um, you're welcome to send more donation to us or to St. James or both. Um, and our, I just put our contact information in the comments if you want to contact Emiliano or myself. Um, and we're happy to stay a few of them extra minutes and answer questions or um, if you have any specific burning things about boundaries and protection, we're also happy to talk. Madeline, Madeline any last announcements on your end? Yeah, thank you both. I, I just wanna take a moment to thank our teachers, to thank Emiliano and to thank Kara for everything that they're holding in their brains and holding in their hearts and uh, just the way that they are sharing their experience with plant medicine with all of us. Uh, one thing that is really special about Bayheart as a collective is that we're a collective of experienced practitioners. And so we're trying to share our experience with you in as many ways as we can through these classes, through making medicine, uh, through our hotline. And we're really grateful that you're coming to this class. Uh, it supports our work. It supports us in being able to do all of those things. It's supporting St. James. And if you have the capacity, the generosity to support us more, we have a donation page on our website and we would just be so grateful. And, and that donation would be going to, to support future education, future medicine making, um, future service on the hotline. So thank you all very much. Yeah. That goes for folks watching the video after the fact too. You're still welcome to donate. <laughs> 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 yeah, great. So should we turn off the recording as we go into questions without make questions easier for folks? Give me a thumbs up if you want us to turn off the recording. I see a nod. One nod's good enough for me. Okay. Do you want to go ahead and pause recording, Madeline? I'm happy to pause the recording too. And if you're gonna like give a chunk about boundaries, then mm -hmm. I'll um, turn okay. it back on if that feels appropriate. Well, so for those who are on camera right now, do you all wanna talk for another five minutes about herbs for boundaries? Let's versus talk and start going directly into questions. So let's do boundaries. Okay, questions. I saw more support for boundaries. So, Kara, so we won't turn off the recording for the moment. Okay. Do you want to talk about Ocotillo? Do you want me to? We both love Ocotillo. We do. 
I'll start talking about Ocotillo and then you can jump in with more Ocotillo. Okay. Um, I think of Ocotillo, this is a desert cactus um, and it's, a, it's like psychic barbed wire. It's like setting up your fence with like spikes that no one's gonna pass through, but you can see for miles, right? It's not like a wall. It's, it's keeping out what you are not inviting in. It's, it's creating a um, semi-permeable membrane so that what you allow in can come in and what you need to keep out gets kept out. Um, if you've ever seen it, it looks like this like big long sticks, very, very narrow sticks covered in spikes with these in just in the springtime, this like flame of red flowers coming out the top. Um, and it is literally used to make fences, to make boundaries yeah. in the desert. People will take the dead looking sticks and plant them in the ground and run barbed wire between them or whatever things between them. And then in the springtime, it'll rain and those dead sticks will bloom and they will grow green leaves. So this is very much a boundary and resiliency plant that you look dead for years and all of a sudden you bloom. <laughs> Uh, I also think that, oh, there's our cotillo. Oh, beautiful. beautiful. Thank you, Madeline. That's a great picture. Yeah. Um, we, deba we debated showing faces for every plant as we went, but we wanted to show our faces and not in tiny the whole time. So hopefully it was okay that we didn't share. We love all of these plants so much. I feel like we did, would have just talked about how pretty they are <laughs> instead of talking about the properties. Um, I was also just going to add on that Ocotillo I find that it's really helpful when folks feel just like a little too vulnerable and kind of like weak in vulnerability. Um, like just too much has happened and like you need some reinforcement. And um, so that like, so that you don't have to like really hide deep within instead. Ocotillo like helps create that boundary so you can like stay in yourself rather than going and hiding. Um, yeah, or for folks who just kind of feel oversensitive. Um, I, I think of it as helping hold our boundaries for us in those moments when we're weaker, just like not as able to hold our boundaries um, until we are strong enough again or have done the healing or the other work that we need to do so we can hold those boundaries appropriately. Um, yeah, it's such a good plant. It's such a good protective plant. I really love it. Yeah. Um, and we would be remiss if we didn't talk about yarrow in terms of boundaries. And yet when I think of boundary plants, it's not the first plant that I comes to my mind, but it's the first plant that any herbalist will tell you is for boundaries. And I kind of think of, there's yarrow and there's wolfberry. Wolfberry is like goji berries, right? It's this kind of slightly toxic plant that we eat as fruit and medicine and food um, that is I think of wolfberry as like exact, ex actually what people think of when they think of boundaries, like you peed on your territory so that somebody else doesn't really want to come into it. Like you, you like lifted your leg and like sprayed on the space that's yours. Um, so it, it, and you know, when your boundaries are here, you have no room to breathe or move. And so when your boundaries are here, out here, you actually have capacity to move in the world and feel vibrant and have this like spaciousness. And Wolfberry is about like sniffing and pissing and making space, using your elbows a little bit. Whereas Yarrow, I think people think they want to use it for that, but I think of Yarrow much more as, Yarrow is community medicine. Yarrow grows up amongst all the other plants and you won't even notice it. And then it's like the carpet underneath and in between all of these plants. And so Yarrow is about connections and also not being a psychic sponge right it's about like having your space in the community but not necessarily like pissing on it so nobody even wants to get close to you right like that's the wolfberry the wolfberry is the um keep it over there i need extra space the yarrow is like bring it on close honey but i'm just gonna maintain that i am me and you are you and we're not just gonna mesh and become one human um, so if you're, if you're doing that with people you live with or you work with or your lovers or your sweeties, you know, like it doesn't always work to get 
entangled and enmeshed as the same human. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I think of I think of Yero as being medicine for like codependence, right? When we like don't have a clear sense of where we stop and somebody else begins in community, in romantic relationship, and in lots of different settings. So it is about boundaries, but it's about that specific kind of boundary, right? Like just like your Kara was saying, like the emotional entanglement, um, like helping head off merginess. Um, yeah, having healthy relational boundaries. Um, I also just want to tag on that for all of these, as we're talking about them in terms of protection, um, we're talking about energetic doses. So we're talking about essence or a drop of the tincture, or you can smudge some of these. You can use them as oils on your body. You can take baths. Like th these are again, not herbs that like you have to like take within you to do a physical action, right? We're, we're talking about energy um, work here. And it's so interesting. Karen, I have kind of slightly different perspectives about wolfberry. My sense of wolfberry is that I, I have never heard Kara talk about it before, and it's really interesting for me to hear. Um, it's similar, but there's it's a little different. The way that I think about wolfberry is that it just um, it makes you take up just exactly the amount of space that you need to take up to be you. And like, yes, that is often like like your boundaries. I am taught like should be like here, not here. Like you do need a little bit of wiggle room, but it's just like being exactly the amount of you that you need to be in your whole body, in your whole space. And that that's about power also, about balanced power and appropriate power. Um, and that when you're in your full self, like that's a way to be in good power. Yeah. So I, I like, it's a small, it's maybe a subtle difference. Like we're both talking about um, our territory, you know? Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. And I wouldn't say they're opposite or separate. Oh, no. Oh, no. To. Oh yeah, absolutely. I actually, yeah. I've learned my wolfberry medicine from Karen and Sarah. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> I, yeah, I haven't heard the pee part. I was like trying to think of some like golden showers, like you know, like, um, nice thing that I could say. I didn't quite get there. Okay. And um, yes, Sammy, to answer your question, you can eat the goji berry. You can um, you know, make a tea with it. You can take a drop of it. You can put a, a couple of fruits in a broth or yeah. And it is, it's beautiful medicine. I love wolfberry. I don't know, have, who here, who here has tried wolfberry? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I mean, Sid, what do you think? Do you love, like, does wolfberry make you feel so good? I mean, yeah. I, use, <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, I use it a lot, but it's in, like, in Chinese medicine, mm -hmm. uh, Chinese herbal stuff, but it's so, it's just sweet and good and it makes me happy. Yeah. And just like, I like I like how you said like the like the space to take up my full my full space or my full self. Like there's a it's like a like kind of like that. Mm -hmm. I like yeah, it. And then there's an ease and just like knowing exactly yeah. how much power you are, exactly how much space you are. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't um, breathe when you don't have the capacity to fully expand your lungs, right? When you don't have this extra space to just be settled in your body and breathe. Yeah. Um, oh gosh, I was gonna say one other thing about it. I left. Oh, just the goji berry and wolfberry are like cousin plants. They're not. They're not the same plant. Uh, and we're talking about them interchangeably. They're very, very similar in both in their medicine, um, and may have some slight differences. I don't. I, I haven't been taught specifically the energetics of goji. So it sounds like the so experience is that they are very, very paired. Um, yeah, I just want to name on my end. I, I can't speak to whether they, there are some subtle differences there. Yeah. Rosemary? Rosemary is great. Rosemary is so protective also. It's one of those plants that is really, really protective against negative energy in general. You can plant it outside your house. You can smudge with it in terms of actually creating a smoke with a plant. You can do a like more accessible smudge for some people if, if for folks who can't be around smoke or kind of you know scent in that way um, uh, you can dip the rosemary in salt water and use that kind of as a smudge to go around a space and clear a space um, but you know different smudges work in different ways and wrote the the kind of vibe with rosemary is like anti-negativity and protection at the same time um, it's also good for a lot of the medicines we've been talking about have some kind of a heart connection, right? Especially those that do some kind of a boundary work or some kind of protective work. The heart is really important center for how we 
experience the world, um, judge, like judge things in a feeling way rather than in a head way, right? Um, and, and rosemary is one of those plants that also works on the heart, um, that it, it opens the heart uh, to love with, with good boundaries and with self-protection. Um, yeah, I've, I've also been taught that it's good for strength against your enemies. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to say anything else about rosemary? Um, I think of rosemary as very warming and stimulating. So if you're needing action to be able to voice your boundaries, um, it's a lovely one. It, it brings warmth and circulation and healing and energy where there is coldness and stuckness and um, inability to, to move or speak or ask for what you need. Um, it's also very traditionally for memory and being able to like name what you need and remember what you need and um, to call in and voice it. Um, and it's also historically used in rituals of making commitments. Um, so whether you were hand fasting or um, making commitments to yourself, to others, to um, communities, that that it the smell brings back that commitment. Um, and a lot of folks, you know, will use rosemary as a as a medicine to study with because our olfactory sense is so great for bringing back memories um, and so using it in something that you want to remember later on just like having it in your pocket having the smell on your hand um, helps you remember that commitment to yourself to um, maintaining your boundaries when they when it gets difficult yeah and the way that the physical and the, the you know emotional and spiritual are not separate rosemary is a circulatory system stimulant and and that includes the brain like it brings more blood flow to the brain which can help the brain function better so like when we're talking about memory and stuff like that there's also we can we can pin it on a physiological thing and also we can understand that it's not just that physiological thing right yeah so I think those are some of the protective herbs we wanted to talk about to help help you know take care of your hearts and your spirits in this time. Do we want to move into questions and maybe stop the recording? Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna pause the recording right now. Great. Thanks. Stop Natalie. the recording right now. Great.